I thought I would uh, be a little bit provocative and talk to you about why we should start to think about infection control, not through the hospital, the idea of the hospital, but rather as a big picture intervention um, regarding antimicrobial resistance. So one title could be the critical role of infection control in antimicrobial resistance, or seeing IPC through the lens of AMR control. And I have my disclosures there. So by way of overview, I thought I'd talk about the problems of IPC concepts, uh, IPC and antimicrobial resistance, and what uh, from the WHO, the sort of four pillars, as we tend to call it here in Australia, of AMR control, why IPC is uh, the key AMR activity, expanding IPC perhaps beyond the hospital, although we won't talk too much about that, and then finally, why isn't AMR a patient safety issue? So in many ways, I think all of us, particularly doctors, but all of us really are some, in some cases our own worst enemy in that we use a whole lot of jargon that, that, that confuses people, particularly uh, out in the community and therefore politicians. And we sometimes make a complex topic more complex instead of simplifying it. So some examples of annoying issues. You know, we use quality and safety interchangeably. And I'll come back to this in a minute, why they're actually different. That in, in, if we're thinking about a One Health agenda, we talk about agriculture versus veterinary versus animal health. Maybe not the topic for today, but actually we, maybe we should be talking about human health and animal health and simplifying it. That we talk about CRE and CPE. I come from Victoria where we have CPE guidelines, that is carbapenemase producing Enterobacteriaceae instead of carbapenem carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae. And you'll see in the new guidelines that WHO made the decision to stick to CRE as the, recognising that a lot of the resistance is due to carbapenemase producing genes, but whether it's, you know, the resistance is due to the gene or not, it's still bad and you, the intervention's the same. And then finally, the issue about in IPC or infection <coughs> prevention control being a hospital issue. Really, and some of the language we use tends to encourage that. So some of the problems with IPC con concepts would be that IPC is about HAI control, that is hospital acquired infections. IPC therefore is a hospital issue. IPC is a quality initiative and a human health issue. Or well, maybe it's broader than all of those things. So if you start with this uh, misnomer that IPC is about HAI control, well, this has political ramifications because HAI means hospital acquired infections and here in Australia and most countries, hospitals are a state issue and therefore it's not a issue, national issue and I was going to ask Benedetta, what, you know, what does she think about the fact that Australia does not have a national IPC program? Well, this is one of the reasons, I think, because we constantly talk about it being HAI control, and so the, uh, essentially in federal politics it's now a state issue, so therefore no one does anything, or it's patchy. So this national versus state issue, the responsibility <coughs> for IPC and guidelines and enforcement, funding and central coordination, this is something that's, apart from hand hygiene, that we're lacking this as a federal initiative, that, um, which we, where I think that's a, a problem. And it encourages the view that surveillance, similarly, another misnomer, is about microbiological surveillance. Well, as we know from Phil Russo and, and Brett Mitchell and others, and Sally, that HAI surveillance is just as, you know, is an important infection control prevention issue. It's not about the lab, it's about humans. What about IPC as a hospital issue? Well, the perception is that it limits it just to human health, it limits IPC to just one component of healthcare, that is hospitals, what about general practice, community health, and so forth. And it limits who is responsible and is, is gonna take any responsibility for doing something about it. Instead, shouldn't we be, say, be saying that IPC is everybody's business, both in hospitals, in the community? What about IPC at home? how to prevent your family from getting sick by cooking practices and so forth. You know, and the, you know, at home, often common sense measures are the most important, but you know, of course, common sense is not always common. So should we be using our language differently so that it doesn't just restrict people to be thinking about hospitals? 
What about IPC as a quality issue? Well, I think that you know this is a problem because the perception is, in my mind, quality versus safety. The quality is vague. It's without boundaries. Quality equals guidelines. Doesn't equal rules. It's a bit like in Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, he says the, the code is more like a guideline rather than an actual rule uh, when he's talking to Johnny Depp. Maybe Johnny Depp should have listened to this when he brought his dogs into Australia. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the perception is that it, it's about guidelines, their quality is a local or a state issue. Well, what we need for success is to embed IPC into mandatory practice standards that actually it's like a pilot. You know, he doesn't have guidelines. He has standards, he has rules, or she, that you either do it or you don't fly the plane. And I think that we need to move to this sort of language so that healthcare accreditation standards, we should be starting to think about the IPC as, so not just participating in hand hygiene or having an infection control department, but how do you actually perform and whether you meet certain minimum standards. So if IPC became a safety issue, as opposed to using the word quality, we would say, well, with safety, there are rules and you must do it. You either, it's black or it's white, it's not gray, it's not the code where it's optional. So this is about language. So it, what about IPC in human health? Well, the sense currently is that it limits the potential of IPC concepts to human health. If we talked about it as IPC is everybody's business, that suddenly, not only the examples I gave before about the, the, the home, but what about the farm? Because actually, if we're going to stop using 85% of Australia's antibiotics are used in agriculture, not in human health. And if we actually started using IPC in, in farms, they use the word biosecurity, but actually farm design and incorporating hospital concepts of infection control would help reduce antibiotic use on, in, in, on farms, also protecting farmers. I mean, I know a number down near my place who they do vaginal exams on their cows to check whether, you know, if they're trying to turn a calf around without wearing gloves, you know, and then wonder why they get le leptospirosis. And of course, then there's other issues of IPC in food production. So, you know, here's my first uh, wool crop uh, when we were shearing. And if I went on the internet and looked at for shed design for shearing sheds, immediately you come up with all these different designs, you know, in New South Wales particularly, fantastic. Ock health and safety, how not to break your back, how to, you know, uh, load the, the wool bales. But if you go and look for the ideal piggery design, recognising the pig, pig production, pork production is the number one user of antibiotics in Australia, you don't find any ideal design for, for piggeries. And yet we now know the pork industry are, are, are rapidly moving in this area about the ideal using hospital spatial separation of sick patients and so forth for pigs, um, because pigs are worth about as much as a human. Um, so, you know, this is, this is an important conceptual thing about IPC, that it's not just about hospitals. And so it was pretty interesting to me when I was uh, spending some time earlier this year with Benedetta and the team at WHO and, and uh, attended the uh, executive board of the uh, WHO. Very interesting to be there with all these uh, key people around. And if you look at the, uh, what they talk about at IPC and AMR, so they talk about the four pillars of AMR control, one being surveillance, whether it's laboratory or human or drug usage, two, infection prevention control, three, stewardship, and four, uh, research and development. So if you look at surveillance, well, it takes time to establish. It's critical to providing information, but it's actually not a control measure. It's not an intervention. It's just recording stuff, okay? I mean, it's important to direct where you're going to do your intervention, but in and of itself, it doesn't do much. What about antibiotic stewardship? Well, the impact on AMR, there is an impact, but, it, but does it control the spread of existing clones? No. Well, it probably does a bit, but we don't know exactly how much. And then, of course, there's a whole issue of futile care, and we all know what I would call medical morons, the people who never give up and give every drug to every person and so forth. They're hard to control. So it's important, but it takes time to take effect. It's critical in animal health, but potentially conflicts with productivity aims on the farm. And the main limitation is, is about changing human behaviour, and that we know there are lots of studies saying that takes a long time to do. 
What about research and development? Well, clearly there's a whole new initiative about using vaccines um, to protect, you know, there are large studies now, so using the use of vaccines to reduce disease burden, therefore the reduced uh, antibiotic prescribing, and therefore reduce AMR. Point of care tests are important, but they have cost implications. There's, well, I think we need more research on practical IPC, you know, all the gowns and gloves that we use, we tell everyone to do it, but we also know a lot of people don't do it. Is it all really necessary? In my hospital at least, the Van B VRE now, we just use a, a plastic apron and rely on alcohol hand rub because uh, we've got such poor compliance with these other things. And then, of course, we need new drugs, but there's so much discussion about new drugs, it sucks all the oxygen out of all the other elements of um, AMR control. So if we now come to infection prevention and control, I would argue this is probably the most immediate thing that we can do about AMR control. That the bushfire of antibiotic resistance is, is running fast, and yes, we need new fire trucks and helicopters to put out the flames, that is new antibiotics, that's five or 10 years away, and in the meantime, we need to cut a fire break, and that fire break is infection prevention and control. And in fact, why is it that IPC, you know, why is IPC really the low hanging fruit of antimicrobial resistance? Well, the key principles of IPC are actually very well established, as you've just heard from Benedetta. It's proven to prevent cross resistance on transmission. Just ask Florence Nightingale when she spatially separated infected patients. And it's, we now have a WHO guideline that actually in really rigid terms says, well, here are the core components of any national <coughs> program. So actually Australia has no excuse not to say, well, we need a national program that's going to implement these, these core components and not just rely on the states or individual hospitals to do this. And as we've just uh, mentioned just this week, we've now got specific guidelines about CRE control, which is a really, really major issue in uh, most of our hospitals. So um, there are many basic IPC initiatives and uh, many would argue that actually they're all potentially implementable in what's called in low and middle income countries, let alone countries like Australia. Whereas many of the other elements that I've just described are quite hard for low and, poor, uh, low and middle income countries to implement. Um, and we know even in Australia we're not doing it all particularly that well. So if we can, I would argue that if we can't adequately implement IPC, what hope do we have of AMR control? So we really should be focusing on this. So of course the basics we've already heard from Bennett are hand hygiene, and you know hand hygiene is currently a standalone program. But you know there's a, there's a, a terrific summit in, in uh, Sydney on Wednesday, and a lot of people there say, well, you know, why are we talking about hand hygiene and not about standard precautions? Where's the equivalent of hand hygiene in measuring the uptake of standard precautions? And I think that's true. I mean, we don't have WHO guidelines, but we, you know, we can certainly develop these things ourselves if need be. And I think it's an important thing. What about hospital cleaning? You know, we know most cleaners are men, so there's a starting problem there. But, you know, <laughs> nevertheless, you know, do we have international standard for, for cleaning? What's the role of simple products like hypochlorite? So like in my hospital, the whole hospital now is cleaned with bleach. We only have one cleaning product. Um, why isn't there a national, pro and we've shown massive reductions in VRE with this. Why, why don't we have a national standard for cleaning? I mean, it's not that hard. Okay? And it could lead to a lot of savings in ordering this stuff. What about spatially separating infected patients? You know, you think about it, hospitals are insanely stupid places. We take all these sick patients, we force them into the one building, then we force them to share toilets, and then we wonder why they cross-transmit organisms. I mean, hospitals are like a giant PCR machine. You put in one infected patient and then it multiplies up. So, you know, should we be thinking about this? And you know, this common, this thing about, you know, the new mantra for architectural design of hospitals should be the patient to toilet ratio. And whether your bum's like this or better like this, that, you know, the, the new mantra should be one bum per toilet. In, so more and more single rooms like Royal Adelaide Hospital and Fiona Stanley Hospital both have high proportion of single rooms, each with their own bathrooms. So this is an important decision because, you know, it's a 10 year decision as hospitals are getting built, that we need to say, look, enough, you know, my hospital's got 30% single rooms and they're all full of patients with, who are colonised with multi-resistant organisms. There's no single rooms for dying patients anymore because they're full of all these other things. We need more single rooms. What about IPC and healthcare? So you start with the basics, as I mentioned, so hand hygiene, cleaning, 
spatial separation, and then finally, as we all know, device insertion and maintenance, particularly peripheral IV lines. Why don't we have a national policy for IV insertion and removal of these lines? Why is it that you go to five different hospitals and they've all got slightly different peripheral IV lines? They all have, we had our, we've, we've now got an IV line insertion and maintenance policy, but prior to that, our, we had five different policies in our hospital, the short one of which was 27 pages. 27 pages, no one read it. You know, why don't we have this nationally? Similarly for urinary catheters. So there are a lot of things we could do. So finally, in just the last couple of slides, redefining now not only IPC as an AMR issue, but redefining AMR as a, not a quality issue, which of course it is, but as a patient safety issue. And so it was a real pleasure while I was in uh, Europe to go to this uh, Global Ministry Summit on Patient Safety in Bonn. This is um, where the, it's in the old, Bonn was previously the capital of Germany, now of course it's moved back with the unification to Berlin. And this was the par parliamentary building where they held the discussions with the uh, fat, hen, oh, fat, uh, fat hen, as the Germans call it, overlooking this area. And it was a really tremendous conference where it actually talked about issues of AMR now being a patient safety issue. That is it acceptable, it should be black and white about uh, adhering to these things. So why a patient, safety, a patient safety is serious, something must be done, it's non-optional, it's like I was discussing before, using the term safety instead of quality. It allows the development of clear rules. You know, safety is mandatory adherence, not the code. There's punishment for non-compliance. We're now at a point, I think, where there are really no excuses and there should be punishment for non-compliance. There's development of legislation, then embedding IPC and other AMR interventions into human and animal health practice is a natural follow-on <coughs> from that. You know, you can't produce pork unless you use a shed or a production thing that fits into certain guidelines which are shown to be safe. I mean, you could see it extending into agriculture. You can't run a hospital unless it meets certain standards for design to be optimal to stop cross-transmission. This should be where we're aiming for in the future. So in conclusion, AMR is no longer simply a health issue, it's a social issue, it's certainly an economic issue and it's an environmental issue also. Among the four key components of AMR control, IPC initiatives are the most practical to implement now. We've got a good start with hand hygiene, I think we should think wider than that. And if IPC, concept, you know, IPC concepts actually do fit in quite well with the One Health AMR agenda, and we need to establish an IPC fire break. Thanks very much for your attention.